a religious relationship with God is no longer going to be tied to any location. It's not going to be here, and it's not going to be in Jerusalem either, but it's going to be those who worship Him in spirit and truth, wherever they're located. Now, in Bible, the synagogue comes, comes into being. Yes, it does. The idea of having synagogues in every city, worship places, and which kind of just can be developed. Yes. Church now served as a model or a launching pad for the church and synagogue system. And the church is not <clears throat> buildings. No, it's people. <laughs> yes, yeah, that is hard to uh, that is hard to impress on some folks. Uh, so the captives were going to learn that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. He is not limited there, and will never. He was never even limited there when he lived in the tabernacle in the temple. He gave them a special manifestation of his presence over the uh, mercy seat in between the two cherubim. But to say that God is here but he's not outside the tent is a mistake. He is still omnipresent, but he was with the Jews in a special, special way. That's just a place that he promised to meet with them. Yes, I will meet with you there. I will put my name there. Yes. Uh, verse 19, he promises to give this remnant of godly people a new spirit and a new heart, take the stone heart out and give them a heart of flesh. All of the saved are going to have a new spirit put within them, and it's going to be a dire con a contrast to the spirit of those in Jerusalem and the idolaters who still infested the, uh, yes sir, who infected the second, who still infested the uh, exiles because they were far from perfect. Yes sir, Jimmy? I'll try to speak loud enough so you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jesus also told that to the woman of Samaria. She said, you know, we worship in the mountains. And Jesus said, you know, there will be a day when we will not worship in the mountains nor in Jerusalem. We're going to worship everywhere. Yes. So you went on out Jesus actually telling them exactly what's been said here. Yes. And uh, and this example in Isaiah gives us a hint of what is coming, that we're not going to be limited to brick and mortar or studs and uh, wood and uh, roofs or anything else. Uh, we can worship God anywhere at any time that we are, wherever we are. Uh, he says that I will put a new spirit within them and these people, this remnant, are going to act by new principles, walk by new rules. Uh, they're going to have a different set of goals than they had before. Uh, they're going to have a new name. Isaiah 66, I believe, talks about that. They're going to have a new uh, Disposition, new opinions, all of these things make up the heart because that's the people that we really are. Uh, Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. New creature. We will have new goals. Everything will be new. Uh, one heart looked forward to the unity of the people after they were restored. Uh, the heart of stone is a a heart that's been hardened by sin and a refusal to repent. It's just the one that's got to be fixed before it will ever be acceptable to God. And the heart of flesh he promises to replace that heart of stone is, is a heart that can is impressionable. Is that a good word? It's a tender heart. A heart that will listen and do its best. Now we're not talking about perfect people here. We're talking about people who strive to do these things to the uh, best of their ability according to the will of God. Uh, it's a heart that's sensitive and responsive to God's touch and wishes. Let's see, verse 20. Uh, out of the uh, new heart and new spirit, there was to grow a new way of living. Because if the new spirit and the new heart doesn't produce that, it's not a new spirit and a new heart. 
is how they're changing our conduct and our outlook. Uh, it'll be a life of righteousness and obedience. Question. And it's interesting here, who's going to make all of this possible? God, he's, he's going to have to be the one from where this new heart comes. Because we can't do this on our own. We can't take the old one out and put the new one in with God can. And if God decides had decided he didn't want to fool with this, won't be to us. So it has to be God's doing. Verse 22. Now we're going back to the cherubim, the throne, the chariot, if you will. The cherubim before them lifted up their wings with their wheels beside them, spinning, and the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah, of the God of Israel, I'm sorry, hovered over them. The glory of the Lord, verse 23, went up from the midst of the city, uh, and he's riding his chariot now because he's on the four cherubim, and stood over the mountain, which is east of the city. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God to the exiles back in Chaldea or Babylon. You remember he had been picked up and taken over there and shown all of the abominations in chapter 8, 9, 10, and 11 that had been going on inside the temple or on the temple grounds to impress upon Ezekiel the terribleness of these people and the fact that they deserved what was coming. Okay, but the Spirit, uh, so the vision, of verse 24, so the vision I had seen left me and I told all the exiles I told the exiles all the things that the Lord had shown me. Now, the manifestation or the Shekinah of the Lord had already left the temple and had stopped over the threshold. And then it moved to the eastern gate. And now he's left the city completely to the mountain, which is to the east, which we know as the Mount of Olives, where Jesus spent the night before his crucifixion. And under that wonderful prayer that John, I believe it's John, records. So it's the Mount of Olives where God's Spirit, uh, who has left the temple, is now located. Uh, verse 25, he says, I told the exiles everything that the Lord had told me, and that's everything in 8, 9, 10, and 11. So he had a long lecture for these people to hear. Uh, I just saw this from the Lord. And I want all of you elders who came to me, by the way, who came to me, I want you to hear what God just told me or what I just saw in this vision from God. Any further questions? Because we have the Spirit of God, okay, now on the uh, Mount of Olives and they... Uh, Ezekiel and the Spirit of God have parted ways. <laughs> Ezekiel's back in Babylon, and the Spirit of God, last we know of, is still on that mountain. No question. I love it. Chapter 12. Ezekiel is going to prepare for a trip. The interval between 11 and 12, we don't know. Could have been two days, could have been two weeks, could have been two months. Don't know. But anyway, the word of the Lord came to him again, saying, Son of man. I bet you Ezekiel's getting used to hearing that by now. <clears throat> you live in the midst of the rebellious house, even among the exiles, who have eyes, and of course the rebellious house could include them all, <clears throat> who have eyes to see but do not see, ears to hear but do not hear, for they are a rebellious house. You know, people and children, especially who are rebellious, won't listen. As long as they're in that state, they don't have anything that they want to hear from you. They won't pay a bit of attention because they're in complete and open rebellion. And that's the state, unfortunately, of God's people. Therefore, son, in verse 3, prepare for yourself baggage for exile, and go into exile by day in their sight. Even go into exile from your place, that's your home, to another place in their sight. And we'll figure all this out in just a minute. 
Perhaps then they will understand, though, that they are uh, a rebellious house. Bring your baggage out by day in their sight as baggage for exile. Then you will go out at evening in their sight as those going into exile. Dig a hole through the wall in their sight and go out through it. Load the baggage on your shoulder in their sight and carry it out in the dark. You shall cover your face so that you cannot see the land, for I have set you as a sign to the house of Israel. <clears throat> and I guess Ezekiel says, well, this is not as strange as some of the other things that you've asked me to do. And you remember them. We don't need to rehash them. <clears throat> this is pretty tame compared to what else, what other dramas or pantomimes that you have asked me to carry out. Uh, this was probably in the year 591 B.C. is our best guess as the time, which would make it about four years before the, uh, uh, the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, five years before the fall, or four years before the beginning of the siege. Boy. Okay. Okay, the dramas that Ezekiel is to carry out here is designed to undermine the exile's confidence that Judah is going to be uh, a Jerusalem that uh, will be ready to receive the exiles back and that things are going to be fine. And they were to be taught how utterly futile was the hope that Judah, uh, Jerusalem could hold out against Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian army. In verse 2, uh, you live in the midst of a rebellious house. Now, who picked up on this same eyes to hear, eyes to see but don't see, and ears to hear but don't hear? Jesus himself in the Gospels about the Pharisees and some others of the religious leaders. He picked that up from, I think Isaiah uses it too. Uh, <clears throat> Chapters 12 through 19, by the way, will tell us about the wickedness of all the leaders in Jerusalem. The uh, royal leaders, the uh, uh, kings, the prophets, and the priests, unfortunately. Those are the ones that are in the exile. We're going to be. Oh, well, yes. Jehoiachin and Zedekiah is about to join. Yes. Uh, because the, uh, the captives in Babylon probably complained a lot about their condition and circumstances and looked to the inhabitants of Jerusalem as being the happy, lucky people and believed that uh, they would continue that way because the false prophets in both the exiles and Jerusalem were telling them, hey, things are going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, and, encouraged, and they encouraged the people, the false prophet did, to stand up to Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian army, which turned out to be an absolute disaster to try to do that. Uh, in verse 3, we finally get into uh, what Ezekiel's, I guess you could call it a pantomime or a drama, one-man drama, silent movie, silent movie. Uh, and it was, of course, designed, all of these were designed to stop the people and get their attention. Hey, I'm walking to work and I saw this guy packing it. You know, and I know who that guy is, too, because he's done some strange things before. And then it again. Yeah, he's at it again. And so they would actually be curious at what Ezekiel was doing. And Ezekiel was probably pretty good as an actor to get their attention because all of this carried out and nobody's watching is worthless. It's a waste of time. <clears throat> okay, the word prepare in verse 3 tells me that the prophet makes his preparation a busy, busy affair to attract the attention of as many people as, as he can, and he's going to go out there and make a big deal out of getting everything ready. He's going to go through and say, should I take this pair of shoes for these? I'll take these. 
should I take this sash or this sash? I think I'll take that one and put it in the bag. Kind of similar, very similar maybe to a, a duffel bag. I don't know. Uh, so he decides he's going to take this, but not that. And uh, should he take something heavy for cooking or should he take something light? And he goes through all of the routine that you would go through trying to pick what am I going to carry? How would you like to have to carry what I, uh, decide what I'm going to carry in a duffel bag as I go 600 miles and live in exile? And you're trying to pick it, huh? Everything that you own will be in that bag. Everything that you can carry. So you've got to choose. Very carefully. Yes, the rest of it stays at home. And probably gets burned in the fire in Jerusalem. Verse 4, he says, bring out your baggage. And what he means, he says, I think, is bring out that double bag. Set it out in some convenient place. Uh... To be ready with, for him when he attempts his escape at the night or at the twilight. And these articles were then brought out and were left out where people could see it as long as the daylight lasted. And he says in verse, uh, what, where does he say in their sight? Verse, uh, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, well last part of verse 7. I went out in the dark and carried my baggage on my shoulder in their sight so they can see and consider what in the world is Ezekiel up to now. Oh, we don't have seven. Thank you, John. Well, I don't have seven up here. You didn't pack it in your duffel bag. I forgot to pack verse 7 and everything else in my duffel bag. Let me see if I got it. Uh oh. Yes, it went into exile without <clears throat> the computer. Oh, there it is. I did so as I had been commanded. By day I brought out my baggage like the baggage of an exile. Then in the evening I dug through the wall with my hands. That would be the wall of his house, I think. I went out in the dark and carried my baggage on my uh, shoulder in their side. <clears throat> so I think you can figure out that these actions make sense if you'll think about it this way. Ezekiel takes his double bag from inside his house and places it in the street outside nearby. At evening, he digs through his mud brick house, which is not a big problem, and crawls out as the people look on Ezekiel throws his pack, double bag over his shoulders, covers his face with the other hand, and then stumbles into the darkness on his way to exile. And doing this so that all the people can see what he is doing. Verse 8. In the morning, after I had done all of this, this is the next morning, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, to, said to you, What in the world are you doing? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, This burden, or oracle, or prophecy, usually when you see the word burden, it's something bad. It's like an onus or a burden that someone's got to carry. It's a negative prophecy, roughly speaking. The burden that you have just asked about and that I carried out the pantomime on last night concerns the prince in Jerusalem. Now, who would that be? King Zedekiah. Now, I will tell you this. He was not popular. That's why they called him the prince. He was one of the sons of Josiah. Three of the sons served and one of the his brothers served the last four kings of, Israel, of uh, Judah. But uh, Zedekiah was put on the throne by Babylon, and they didn't like him at all. He was not popular. So they called him a prince instead of a king. The burden concerns the prince in Jerusalem as well as, he 
goes beyond him, all of the house of Israel who are in it, being Jerusalem, say, I am a sign to you, what I just did last night, yesterday, as I have done, packed my bags, carried them out, went out at night, after I dug a hole through the wall in my house, so it will be done to them. They will go into exile, into captivity. The prince who is among them will load his baggage on his shoulder and in the dark and go out just like Ezekiel did. They will dig a hole through the wall to bring him out. They will cover his face so that he cannot see the land with his eyes. I will also spread my net, yet he will not see it, though he will die there. That is, he will not see the land of captivity. You skipped part of that. Did I? Yeah, I will also spread my net up with him, and he will be caught. He will be caught in my snare, thank John. And I will bring him to Babylon in the land of the Chaldeans, yet he will not see it, though he will die there. I will scatter to every wind all who are around him, his helpers and all his troops, and I will draw out a sword after them, so they will know that I am the Lord. When I scatter them among the nation and spread them among the countries, but I will spare a few of them from the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, so that they may tell all of their abominations among the nations where they go, and they know that I am the Lord. <clears throat> so Zedekiah, the last king that Judah had, when he was carried into exile, that ended the monarchy period. That was it. Until a new king appeared some 590 years later. What was his name? Jesus of Nazareth. King of the Jews. <clears throat> Verse 11, a sign. He says, I'll be a sign to you. That means I will be a prophecy or a portent of the evil which is going to fall upon you, not just King Zedekiah. Uh, Ezekiel's promise says basically that I'm my person or I am an emblem of what's going to happen to you. And the same shall be done to you as you saw me do last night. He will cover his face. Now, why do you think Zedekiah covered his face as he was leaving? He's trying to break the siege and sneak out of Jerusalem by night. <clears throat> Probably so that he will not be recognized. And also, for the king, the royalty, to be reduced to such low circumstances was a shame, too. He probably didn't want anybody to see his face as he was humbled to have to dig through the wall or have somebody dig through the wall around Jerusalem and try to escape. By the way, he went down the Jordan River Valley by way of Jericho or tried. Uh, he says in verse 12, uh, I will catch him in my net, which is, of course, the Babylonian army. I will bring him to Babylon. And why did he do that? Because he broke his promise to be loyal to Nebuchadnezzar. And when you do that to a man like Nebuchadnezzar, you can expect repercussions. Nebuchadnezzar didn't have anybody to answer to. He did what he wanted. Most Eastern kings did the same way. <clears throat> he will not see the land. He blinds him, kills his children in front of him, he blinds him. Right. Ribla. At Ribla. We talked about Ribla on the border of Israel. He carried him just across the border of uh, Israel in the north on his way to Babylon, murdered his, every one of his sons, put out his eyes so that by the time he got to Babylon, he was blind and never saw a square foot of the land. So every bit of Ezekiel's prophecy as he carried out this pantomime or drama was fulfilled in the person of what, in the event of what happened to uh, King Zedekiah. 
Verse 14 talks about all that are around him, probably speaking of his royal bodyguard who were charged with keeping him safe no matter what happened, and they panicked and ran. Uh, and verse 16 is an interesting statement. I will spare a few of them from the sword and famine and pestilence, not because they're the righteous remnant, but so that they may tell. Let me tell you what I did and what the kind of things that me and my family and my friends and uh, all of us in Jerusalem did that brought us to this point. In other words, they finally came to realize that he is the Lord and he wants them to go out there and tell them, I want you to tell these people just exactly what you were guilty of. Yes, and acknowledge that we were wrong and that we deserved what Yahweh brought upon us. Now the nations are going to think what about Yahweh? That he was too weak to save them. That he was only a national God confined to the borders of Israel. Therefore, the Babylonian God, I think it's called Nebo, I think, I'm not sure. But anyway, that was not the only God. Uh, was stronger and defeated Yahweh, so he carried it up Yahweh's people into captivity. But he's going to tell these people, I want you to tell them the real reason that you're in the situation that you find yourself. And that's why I'm going to spare a few of you so that when you go into exile, you can tell them why you are there, the real reason why you were there. Any questions? Let's stop right there at verse 17, if you don't mind. Sure you don't have any questions? <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, give us tonight understanding and give us a loving heart for those among us who are struggling so much, Perky and uh, all the others, especially uh, uh, the ones that uh, Buddy and Ed and Lucille and the others that are struggling at this time. John, we pray for your healing hand be upon them that they may be restored to their full health and be back with us here at church and to serve the way they really want to serve in your kingdom and help us to do our best to encourage. Be with us as we leave in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
自己挑。